Welcome. It's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richard. Good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today. Bringing down news of the day, none other than the incomparable Sharon Reed, news anchor, host, and Rebel HQ contributor. Fascinating individual. Should be a great breakdown. Top story of the day. Chinese government has secret jails, secret judicial operations inside of the United States of America. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have so many prisons in this country that other countries are opening up prisons right here. Let's go to it. Here it is. The two complaints charge more than 30 officers with China's national police force, which is called the Ministry of Public Security or the NPS, and two New York City residents with violations of U.S. law. Unlike typical officers, the NPS officers who have been charged today are not focused on preventing crime. Rather, the complaints charge these NPS officers with engaging in transnational repression schemes targeting members of the Chinese diaspora community in New York City and elsewhere in the United States. And as shown in these complaints, the NPS has repeatedly and flagrantly violated our nation's sovereignty. This is fascinating. There could be hundreds of these secret prisons, secret jails and secret operations all over the United States of America and beyond. There's some irony to this story beyond the surface of what you just heard. I'm going to get into the background. Let's put up the picture. Now, the two individuals who are not blurred are the ones at the center of this particular investigation and prosecution. U.S. prosecutors have arrested two men in New York for allegedly operating a Chinese secret police station. You need to understand what that means. These are actual national police officers from the country of China operating in the United States. Uh, this is in Manhattan's Chinatown neighborhood. Lu Jian Wang, 61 years of age, and Ching Jinping, 59 years of age, both are New York residents. They face charges of, conspire, of, of conspiring to act as agents for China and obstruction of justice. Now, keep in mind, obviously, America knows who is in the country. If you are a foreign national and a governmental, governmental official, Typically, the information is registered, all right? So they are expected to appear in a federal court in Brooklyn. China has previously denied operating the stations. Another point of irony here, calling them service centers. No, 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 not jails, service centers for nationals overseas. Mr. Liu of the Bronx and Mr. Chen of the Manhattan Work uh, worked together to establish the first overseas police station in Manhattan, worked together to establish this police station in the United States, excuse me, on behalf of the China, of uh, China's Ministry of Public Security, the U.S. Department of Justice alleged on Monday. The outpost was closed in autumn of 2022, the department said, after those involved became aware of an FBI investigation into the station. Now, when I did the research for this story, the reason the two individuals became aware of the investigation is because, because according to the government, they called them and said they were aware of the operation. So naturally, these two individuals decided to do a big data dump, okay? They des destroyed all data, and now the federal government says, oh, we could not retrieve the cell phone information because after we called them and told them that we were on to them, they erased it. This massive investigation led to a phone call from the government to tell them about the massive investigation so that they could have time, excuse me, that means they had time in order to get rid of evidence. There's more. Americans are in the crosshairs of a spy game. This prosecution reveals Chinese government's flagrant violation of our nation's sovereignty by establishing a secret police station 
in the middle of New York City, said uh, Breon Pierce, the top prosecutor from Brooklyn. The stations are believed to be among at least 100 operating across the globe in 53 countries, including the UK and the Netherlands. And last month, Canada's federal police announced an investigation into two Montreal area sites thought to be police stations from China. China literally has a globalized police force. And what are they tracking? They're tracking individuals who are antithetical to the Chinese form of government. Dissidents, they will call them. They track them in other nations, even if they are citizens of that particular nation, external of the government of China. There's more. In a separate complaint unveiled by the U.S. officials on Monday, 34 officers, actual certified sanctioned officers from China's Ministry of Public Security were charged with using fake social media accounts to harass Chinese dissidents in the U.S. and spread official Chinese government propaganda. Prosecutors said all of the accused belong to an elite task force known as the 912 Special Project Working Group whose purpose is to target Chinese dissidents located throughout the world, world, including in the United States. Now, let's go back. I want you to keep that graphic up. Let's put that graphic back up. What does it say they were charged with? They were charged with using fake social media accounts to harass those who disagree with China. They were charged with using fake social media accounts. There's more. As alleged, the PRC government deploys its national police and the 912 Special Project Working Group, not as an instrument to uphold law and protect public safety, but rather as a troll farm that attacks persons in our country for exercising free speech, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Now, for some of you, you may say, my goodness, this is horrible. This is bad. This is a violation of all types of international decorum. But maybe the story sounds familiar to you. I wonder where did the Chinese government get the idea that they can literally create secret prisons all over the United States of America, really the world, 2007. Let's bring it up. In 2007, the article says people were being picked up around the world and held by the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. These people weren't being held by their own countries intelligence or security services. And they weren't being held or openly held by the US military. Instead, they were lost in the black hole of enforced disappearance, becoming ghosts, held in secret prisons, unknown to anyone in the outside world. They call them black sites of the CIA. These black sites are located around the world in Thailand, Afghanistan, and several Eastern European countries and perhaps elsewhere. The program of CIA secret detention operated in close secrecy for almost five years, authorized by September 17, 2001, a classified presidential directive, which remains secret to present day. The CIA's secret detention program holds people in secret facilities, their detention often unacknowledged and barred from communication with family, legal counsel, or anyone in the outside world. So while the prosecutor is correct and actually going after those who violate rule of law, conduct unbecoming, but damn, America did it best, likely even first. It is ironic, is it not? When you look at the tea leaves here, they want you to buy a narrative that says, we had no idea this was going on. But listen, we know that there are more than 100 of them. We know that they are operating in 53 countries. We know the name of the special group that does it. How do you know so much information if you did not know any information about what was happening? How does this go down? Did the complaints just start? Was somebody involved on the inside that 
crack the case. I got more questions than answers. And yes, I have the ultimate question. Are we still doing it? All right, Sharon, secret prisons from China in this country, maybe elsewhere, taking a playbook from CIA Central. Learn from the best. Okay, I think that's where you have to start here. The other, it's so bizarre though, and it had me thinking which came first, the balloons or the secret <laughs> stations? It is just amazing. And yes, to know that on the one hand, China says, eh, just volunteers, nothing to see here. Drivers, license renewals, checkups, nothing. And on the other hand, what more don't we know that our government is not telling us? Yeah. We shall follow. Developments are sure to come. All right, there's an update. 16-year-old shot for ringing a doorbell. We now have more information. Let's put his picture up for mass here, okay? This is a tragedy. The man responsible for shooting a black 16-year-old in Kansas City, Missouri, has been identified, has been charged. His name is Andrew D. Lester. He's 84. He is charged with first degree assault and armed criminal action. A warrant has been issued for his arrest. His bond has been set at $200,000. Keep his picture up. He was not charged with attempted murder. He was not charged with endangering the welfare of a minor. These are aggravated elements that could ensure he is in prison if convicted until he dies. Lester is accused of shooting a 16-year-old. His name is Ralph Yarl on Thursday night after the teen accidentally went to the wrong house to pick up his siblings. Lester came to the door and shot him in the head, then shot him again, according to a report I read earlier, the second shot was in the arm. No words were exchanged before the shooting. That was put in the probable cause statement. Let's put up the young man. Okay, he should not be on that hospital bed. He should not be there. He should not have went there. Um, he is in stable condition. He has been released according to the most updated report. Prosecuting attorney, let's go to Zachary uh, Thompson. Now, if you remember, Zachary Thompson was actually at the original press conference where the chief of police came out and said uh, that even though they had no information, they could conclusively share because they did not want to compromise the integrity of the investigation. She did say that there was no indication that this was racially motivated. She went out on a limb to make that conclusion. And I said to you then, obviously, she's basing that conclusion on what? the statement of the guy who shot a child, okay? The prosecutor, attorney Zachary Thompson, issued charges against Lester. When asked if anything was said between Lester and Yarl that made Thompson believe the shooting was racially motivated, Thompson said nothing like that is indicated in, in the charging documents. We understand how frustrating this has been, but I can assure you the criminal justice system is working and will continue to work. Let me give you an update to the young man, right? We were actually uh, very happy to um, hear that there's a confirmation. The family confirmed with Fox 4 News that Yarl was out of the hospital on Monday. He's in good spirits. He even cracked a smile today, his father Paul Yarl said. One of his teachers from the elementary school asked him for permission to give a testimony, how good of a student Ralph was. So when Ralph saw that request from his elementary school teacher, he smiled and said, of course, he can talk about me. Why did it take this much? Hmm? Remember yesterday, I clearly said if this was the other way around, if you had a, a young white girl that went up, uh, knocked on the wrong door, wrong doorbell, black male comes out, starts shooting, shoots the white girl, 16 year old white girl, bullets in her body, police come. You think the black male gets a courtesy ride to the city police precinct? and gets a ride back home after a 24 hour hold with no charges? Of course not. They would charge him with whatever is necessary to keep him in that jail. That did not happen in this, in this case. And as a matter of fact, public outcry is the real reason you have a charge so quickly here. You have celebrities literally posting the information of the prosecutor on their social media saying, give him a call. 
This is a public servant. Justice must be done. The mayor, the mayor who went on camera after the police chief basically said, we're waiting for more evidence. It's not racially motivated. Then he comes back and says, we want justice for the juvenile. Wait a minute. If you, if you want justice for the juvenile, that means you believe the man did it and did a criminal act if you need justice for the juvenile who was involved. All of this double talk. You know, at some point, diplomacy has to be thrown out the window. It is okay to disagree at your own press conference, Mr. Mayor, with your chief of police. You know good and damn well she should not have made those conclusions on the record. It's an ongoing investigation. And you also know that if, had, if it had been you, brother, a black mayor, if you would have shot somebody, your ass would have been in jail, period. All right, that's your update. Sharing thoughts on this case. So many. The prosecutor looked like a squirrel. The mayor, too. Very squirrely <laughs> behavior. These are squirrels, and we have to stop accepting it. I want them both to go away. They they yeah. should not serve. They're, they're not leaders. And the fact that right before we went on air, this guy, this Andrew Lester guy, turns himself in. Oh, because he was allowed to, Doc? Yeah. He was I mean, it's pathetic. All of right. this is pathetic. And I'm tired, too. Although I respect and love this young man for being a student and everything great, I don't care if he was on the corner. He should have been treated this way. That's right. That's right. And for those who are pushing back about the age of this individual, uh, the reason why I don't give a damn about his age is because he didn't give a damn about shooting a black child. He did not care about the age of the child. I do not care about his. See how that works? Okay. GOP officials caught talking racial, racist, but their own truth indeed. Here it is. They're insignificant in my life. Yes. Really. Uh, they, they bring the whole saying is, you know, it goes around, goes around it. It's, it will. I told you it will. Yeah. Well, I, know, I know where two big deep poles are here. And they, I got to ask you later. Well, these are our three duds. But the thing of it is, you know. We actually told the truth. I know, I've known two or three hit men that were very quiet guys. Yeah. And would cut no mercy. Yeah. In Louisiana, because it was all mafia around yeah. Louisiana. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but here's the reality. It's a hair on his wife's head, Chris Willingham's head, or any of those people that really were behind all that. If the hair on their head got touched by anybody, who who would be the bad guys? Who'd you blame for? Yeah. I heard him the other day, said, I heard 10 or 12 people go on your surf. I said, F let's get 20. They don't have a goddamn clue what they're getting into. Okay. Oh, it, yeah. Not just the same age. It's a, but, but everybody. But I will tell you something. If it was back in the day, would they, like, when Alan Marshall take a damn blackjack, whoop their ass and throw them in the cell, I'd run the f***ing chair. Yeah. Well, it's not like that no more. I know. <laughs> take them down to a mud creek and hang them up with the damn rope. Yeah. But you can't and do the that. About it, they got more rights than we got. That's how you feel, homie? Hmm. Okay. Let's do it. Put them all up. You heard officials talk about killing people, terrorizing black folk, how many hit men they actually know, and what they would prefer to do to black people overall. The officials come from Oklahoma, right? They were involved in the recording. You have Sheriff Kevin Clardy. You have District 2 Commissioner Mark Jennings. You have a sheriff's investigator, Alicia Manning, and jail administrator, Larry Hendricks, not pictured. District 3 Commissioner Robert Beck, not pictured also is cited in the audio. The conversation occurred following a board of commissioners meeting on March 6th. Let me stop right here. What you just witnessed, what you just heard is what we call systemic racism. It is systemic racism. It is embedded into the cultural normality of their operational dynamic. They are expressing their bias, yes, in a private conversation, but they have 
public responsibilities? Do you not believe that their internal private bias plays out in their external public execution of their job? That makes it systemic. It is now codified inside of a system, a structure, a design that we pay for. So literally in this county, black people are paying for their own oppression by way of their taxpayer dollars. This is why it's important. Um, let's talk about other parts of the recording. All right, the transcript suggests that the group first started discussing a recent fire which killed a woman and her two dogs. The group joked about the woman's body parts falling off her body and that it is similar to um, eating barbecue. So we get her in the body bag and Kylie goes, you do know what we got to do, right? Faith goes, no, what? He goes, you got to preheat the oven 350 degrees. Leave her in there for 15 minutes. Say, Clardy, everybody laughs. Let's put up the governor. He's a Republican, by the way. Okay. Oklahoma governor Kevin Stitt is calling for these four McCurtain County officials to go, to resign immediately. Wasting no time in making this proclamation. He did not say, let me verify this or verify that. Let's wait for an investigation to be completed. He said in a statement, I am both appalled and disheartened to hear the horrid comments made by officials in McCurtain County. Governor Kevin Stitt said in a statement Sunday, there is simply no place for such hateful rhetoric in the state of Oklahoma, especially by those that serve to represent the community through their respective office. I will not stand idly by while this takes place, the governor said. Let's talk about threats against reporters, all right? This has become kind of a new thing since the era of Donald Trump. It is okay to threaten violence against those broadcast. I know I get my fair share of death threats daily. Here it is. The trio was supposedly frustrated with the Gazette News, portraying the sheriff's office unfavorably in their reporting. Well, you don't say. William Ham and his father, Bruce William Ham, paper's publisher, have been advised to temporarily leave town. CNN affiliate KJRH reported. For nearly a year, they have suffered intimidation, ridicule, and harassment based solely on their efforts to report the news for McCurtain County. Kilpatrick Townsend, the law firm representing the, William, the Willingham family, told CNN in a statement, it is so bad for this family, they have been encouraged to leave their own community. You heard what these individuals were saying among each other, how many hit men they know. Not one person in this conversation said, whoa, whoa, buddy, wait a minute. What do you mean? No, everybody was on the same page. Everybody was speaking the same language. You see, when the book is written for you, you don't need a particular organizing structure in order to be an organizing structure. While they may not all go to the same clan meeting, they all have the same ideology, and that makes it dangerous in itself. There's more. Let's go to the sheriff's office response. All right. The McCurtain County Sheriff's Office said in the statement Monday that there is an ongoing investigation into multiple significant violations of Oklahoma security of Communications Act. Understand what they're saying. The violations they're talking about is the Oklahoma Security of Communication Act, which makes it illegal to secretly record a conversation in which you are not involved and do not have consent of at least one of the involved parties. It also said the recording has yet to be duly authenticated or validated. The FBI will not confirm or deny if it was involved in the investigation. So what are they citing? So they have a law in Oklahoma that basically says one party consent, one individual in the conversation must consent that they know the conversation is being recorded. 
you can be the recording party and the consenting party. All right. As long as you are in the conversation, as long as your voice is heard, you're fine. All right. Completely OK. So the sheriff's office, they're not concerned about the fact that members of the government are talking about killing people or that they have intimate relationships with hit men or that they would like to terrorize black folk in that community. They are concerned about a potential violation of the communications doctrine in the state statute. That is the high crime to them. That is what they're going to investigate. And that is what was in the statement. And that is their investigative focus. That they're simply sending a message to who they believe did the recording. That's what they're doing. And the person may get arrested. We don't know. But let me say this. If they have concluded that no one in the recording did it, that means, and I'm talking to the federal prosecutors for when you all do prosecute this case, that means that they had a conversation afterwards, all right? It means they had a conversation afterwards, which also means they had to coordinate that conversation. Text messages, phone calls, maybe emails. All right. Hell of a thing. But guess what? You just witnessed the microcosm of the macrocosm of how it works behind the scenes in American political culture. That conversation is not abnormal around this country. It is simply abnormal that we get access to it. Sharon, thoughts on this case? Yeah, this uh, this recording and the person behind it is heroic, okay? Because yeah. what we're dealing with is a racist mafia here. And I don't think they were joking at all. If you joke no. about torturing black people or killing black and brown people, then that's what you support. That's actually who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and listen, uh, no jokes at all. I mean, they were as serious as can be. Uh, and obviously they've had conversations like this before. That's the indication to me. That's probably why the person decided to record it. All right, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. Always good to be with you, always. All right, uh, I want you to check out Unbossed with my dear sister, Nina Turner, all right? Learn how people can take back control of democracy. It is possible. Never believe that a system is so strong you cannot overtake it. Systems come, comes down to people, that's it, nothing more. Corrupt forces in government, people, 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 nothing more. I want you to find some clips of Unbossed. Scan the QR code or go to youtube.com forward slash Unbossed TYT, Remarkable Show. Okay. Bill's Dragons circles the wagons, says there is, there's an irony to this. The U.S. has performed torture under the name of extraordinary rendition. That's true. Uh, and held who we consider dissidents in friendly foreign nations for decades. China learned from us. That's correct. Yes. Uh, E.R. Field, uh, calling, from, calling them police stations uh, really whitewashes what they are. Uh, this is a foreign intelligence service operating black sites in the U.S. That is correct. They are. That's why I made the CIA comparison. We call the CIA operation black sites. We call them police stations. Good observation. Also, Mo Fury, the CIA may have done this, but no one really knows who started it. This practice was widespread by Soviets in the U.S. during the Cold War. China might just be better at it because we are just now finding out about it. Or are we? All right. And let's go to Twitch. Sonic underscore boom underscore dragon 23. Looks like Dumpy45 made those deals um, with China. It's paying off. And I like how you spelled that because of how he says it. All right. Okay. I got something for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a In Sunday? You're still friends. Let the 
can know I'll be following her so to look for I think it's time that we start lobbying the U.S. Congress for an anti-Karenicity policy to be adopted by corporations all over America. Okay, the Karenicity runs deep in this one. She decided uh, it was not good enough to simply be aggressive against one staff member. Uh, she decided to go in on anyone who spoke up and said something reasonable to her. Well, it doesn't make sense to try your best to create a bad day for another person. Typically, when we engage in these opportunities to learn from Karenicity, um, we look at the goal. What was the potential uh, plan here? Many times, it is not identifiable, uh, as in this case. We don't, we don't know what the end result in the mind of the Karen was. Uh, we do know that the action, the behavior, was good enough to land right here on indisputable, or should I say bad enough, all right? Listen, we do not condone Karenicity, but if Karenicity happens around you, record it and send it to me. All right, Sharon, thoughts here? Well, just, just one really, Doc. I, at first it was like, I thought, well, is this a fake out? Maybe this is just somebody who had a, a temporary break with decorum. And the reason I felt that was because of the mask. Karens don't generally wear masks. But it was down, it was not properly over the nose. and the So I said, you know what? Yeah, full-blown Karenicity. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I saw that too. And, yeah. you know, I wanted to give some level of benefit to the doubt, but it was none left after this Karen finished Indeed. her, right, her hurrah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right, got something for you. Double dose. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a In Sunday? You're, you're still French! Back off! I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life questions came through about how can we stay motivated if we're not going to get a bonus? What can we do? What can we do? Some of them were nice and some of them were not so nice. So I'm going to address this head on. The most important thing we can do right now is focus on the things that we can control. None of us could have predicted COVID. None of us could have predicted supply chain. None of us could have predicted bank failures. But what we can do is stay in front of our customers, provide the best customer service we can, get our orders out our door, treat each other well, be kind, be respectful, focus on the future because it will be bright. It's not good to be in a situation we're in today, but we're not gonna be here forever. It is going to get better. So lead, lead by example, treat people well, talk to them, be kind and get after it. Don't ask about what are we gonna do if we don't get a bonus? Get the damn $26 million. Spend your time and your effort thinking about the $26 million we need and not thinking about what you're going to do if we don't get a bonus. All right? Can I get some commitment for that? I would appreciate that. I had an old boss who said to me one time, you can visit Pity City, but you can't live there. So people, leave Pity City. Let's get it done. Thank you. Have a great day. She received a $6.4 million bonus while, according to the narrative, denying bonuses to her staff members. Um, she is the CEO of Miller Knoll, an overpriced furniture store. Okay. And while she's telling people to work with her, I don't live in Pittyville. Uh, she was pocketing $6.9 million in bonus money. This is what happens when Karen is your CEO, okay? Uh, it is rare, but it does go down. It is interesting to note, uh, let's put up her picture again, full mass here. Uh, this is when she got just really indignant about why these individuals are concerned about a petty bonus when they need to be concerned about making her more money. She said, focus on the $26 million that I need to make this year while you're focusing on your bonus. Okay. This was a hell of a thing.
Um, I actually thought it was a parody at first, and then, you know, we checked it out. Doesn't seem to be. Seems to be an actual Karen that's a CEO. Sharon, thoughts on this? I, too, thought it of SNL, Doc. <laughs> right. But at The Voice, it was just so grating. I was channeling Eddie Murphy in the 80s, like he told Bill Cosby. Okay, she need to have a Coke and a smile. <laughs> right. And, and I'll... You remember the rest. That's wow. Right. Yeah. All right. The audacity. I mean, 6.4 million, madam. I mean, come on. You could not have given your employees any level of bonus just to keep your word to honor whatever promise you made. All right. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable. Stick and stay. All right. Welcome back. Always good to be with you. We have a lot of comments. I will read as many as I can, all right? Somewhat press for time. Wolf Dragon Donna. This CEO Karen makes me wish we could say if. What? Uh, mm, sorry, my 70-year-old self no longer has a filter and no longer cares. I want to be just like you when I grow up. All right, Lynn, I hope CEO Karen didn't think her speech was motivational. Yes, she did. She got off that uh, Zoom conference with a great feeling of pride. Guarantee it. Uh, Tyler Hackner, get Congress to pass an anti-Karen law. That's right. All right, somebody needs to at least sponsor it. Uh, and Link Retro, this is so condescending, talking about the bonus, money, and the Karen. All right, Texas school teacher, it's a damn shame organized basically a fight club inside of the school. This is the second time I've reported on an educator doing something like this. It is not the same story, nor a follow-up. This is a different incident altogether. Put the pictures up. Look at that. Natalie Garcia, 24 years of age, a substitute teacher in Texas is under investigation after she allegedly turned her classroom into a fight club and encouraged students as young as 12 to fight each other. Garcia was immediately fired after the incident at Kimbrough Middle School in Mesquite. Let me give you background to the classroom, classroom fights. So shocking footage from inside the classroom shows desk pushed into a circle to create an actual fight ring, while 12 and 13 year old students duke it out, leaving some batter uh, and others bloody. The school district also said, Ms. Garcia, the school teacher, outlined rules for the children to follow and told one to keep watch at the door while the fights occurred. Garcia, can be heard telling her class that she does not want this on record and threatening to confiscate cell phones if students had them out. The clip shows at least four students fighting each other and the timer can be heard going off at different points during the melees. Garcia shouting 30 seconds before one fight began. Uh, let's put up Ms. Beatrice Martinez. Ms. Martinez, whose daughter recorded the incident, said, and I quote, I was devastated. I was like, I couldn't watch the full video. She added, Martinez says, Garcia taught her daughter's class at least twice before, and there had been no previous incidents. She said her daughter had been pushed to fight three girls during the makeshift fight club, but the class concluded before that could happen. The clock ran out. Uh, let's go to a statement from the independent school district. Uh, Mesquite ISD said Garcia had been hired on March 6th, March 6th, but she was fired after the incident and is not eligible to be rehired. Our investigation revealed that this substitute teacher encouraged students to fight each other during class, outlined rules for the students to follow and even instructed a student to monitor the classroom door while the fights took place the school district said now let me say this to the school district good for you for firing the individual i looked checked it out 
you all could also have her arrested. Yep, you all have the authority to take out individual warrants for those who endanger the safety of children. Why did you not do it? Hmm. I mean, yeah, she's out of the classroom, but what this school teacher did was criminal and it was against children. If there's a time to go ahead and dismiss this diplomacy of profession, it is when children have been harmed. We covered something similar. Put it up. We covered this in January. This was out of Idaho. A substitute teacher, again, Edson Ariola. The teacher was arrested after allegedly encouraging students to fight during class and recorded the fight on video. This teacher set a timer, encouraged his students to fight for 10 seconds while he recorded it. So he gave them 10, this other teacher gave them 30. All right, okay. I don't know what the hell is going on here, uh, but I do know this is a real problem. The fact that we've reported on school teachers, substitute teachers at that, recording, fighting among students with actual lines of um, guides and rules and policy. This is insane. Now, where's the heavy handed approach to make sure these individuals face the penalty they deserve? Or perhaps an investigation into if this is something systemic connected to something else. We're going to continue to follow this. Um, I would tell you very clearly, um, I don't give a damn who you are. I don't give a damn what status you may have. You come after children, you have a problem with me, period. All right, we're going to stay on top of it. Sharing thoughts on this. You're going to have a, a lot of people who you have a problem with because apparently this this is spreading. Doc, two yeah. days ago in Florida, another teacher. Yep. Okay, but something about the rules there were just don't don't pull hair. So I don't know what's infecting the waters in all these jurisdictions, but they, they better figure it out real quick. This is crazy. Yep. And listen, Sharon, we got another one. All right. A school teacher, inappropriate relationship or more than one inappropriate relationship, according to the allegation. Let's put the picture up for a mask. She's married to a police officer. Emma Delaney Hancock, a former substitute teacher at Wellston Public Schools, turned herself in on Thursday because of allegations that she had an inappropriate sexual relationship with a 15 year old student. She then posted a $50,000 bond and was immediately released. So let's go to photos of Hancock and her husband. So Ms. Hancock is married to that fella. She's the wife of Wellston Police Chief Alfred Hancock and the daughter of the town's mayor, Paul E. Whitna. The case is reportedly being handled by the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation to avoid any conflict of interest. Let me go to the affidavit. According to the affidavit filed in Lincoln County Circuit, an OSBI investigator interviewed the 15-year-old student who allegedly had an inappropriate relationship with Ms. Hancock. Ms. Hancock began texting this child in October to send him a school assignment. The affidavit said, after a few weeks, the teen allegedly sent a shirtless photo of himself to Ms. Hancock through Snapchat. The affidavit said Ms. Hancock responded, are we sending half naked, naked pictures now? I don't know, are we? The teen responded. Are you trying to get me to lose my job? Ms. Hancock wrote back according to the affidavit. The document said Ms. Hancock and the teen later began exchanging nude photos and nude videos of sex acts. This escalated into Ms. Hancock and then and the teen kissing each other on their mouths on two occasions while in classrooms. Ms. Hancock also touched the teen inappropriate, inappropriately during the second time they kissed, according to the court filing. Ms. Hancock was facing two counts of soliciting sexual conduct or communication with minors by use of technology and two counts of lewd and indecent acts to a child under 16 years 
of age. Let's put up the superintendent. Buck stops with him. Well, Stone, uh, public school superintendent Mike Franz said as soon as the district learned about the allegations in November, Hancock was removed, was removed from the call list and is no longer going to be a teacher working on the campus. All right. And they are, in fact, cooperating with the investigation. OK, you see, these are real issues. Uh, lawmakers, Republican lawmakers in particular, they're not going to make it a thing because they want you to think critical race theory is really what's going down. OK, uh, the reality is there's a problem here. There's a problem when we have bullying in the schools and we still have it. We saw that as a problem. What happened? We had a full and funded campaign to come after bullying. We called it the anti-bullying campaign. A whole lot of money, a whole lot of emphasis, right? They decided not to include racism in that, by the way. But I digress. Now you have school teachers, once again. Reports are coming every week. What are we going to do? Where's the emphasis? Where's the focus? Even if there's no change in legislative dynamic, there should be a change at least in how we attack and approach such a detrimental issue inside of the school system. These children are adversely impacted, even if you may not be able to see the signs today. This is a violation of trust at a level that they cannot comprehend in the moment, but it plays out over the course of their journey. It is a shame we have these monsters working among our children. Sharon, thoughts on this? Got to be dealt with. And I, I look for uh, Jim Jordan to take his committee on the road to Oklahoma and perhaps he can study predators and, yeah. and deal with this. But it's a very serious issue. And if you care about children, this will be stopped, hard stop. Yep. We'll see what happens. Um, naturally, I don't expect any litigation, excuse me, any legislation to come from this. Uh, but for those who have been adversely affected, we do hope that they get the help they deserve. We got more on the other side. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Let me read some of these amazing comments from you. Bill's Dragons circles the wagon says, all these substitute teachers doing bad stuff with kids would be greatly reduced if these districts would stop paying cheap and pay qualified teachers. That is one of the remedies, yes. And it does work, cause and effect relationship. Trudy, Trudy Lawrence, thank you for being a double doser for eight months. Dr. Richie, special shout out to you for how you educate us with the dangers of these Karens. I was on a flight, had a Karen moment and anti-Karen moment. Thanks to Southwest Pilot for forming up. There you go, good stuff, we appreciate you. And let's go to Twitch. Um, Hunger Games underscore 1989. Some student was smart and recorded it and shared it with someone. That's right. That's exactly what happened. And agnostic sister, what in the holy hell kind of satisfaction did this teacher get from this? She is psychotic. Yep. And then the teacher who had the inappropriate relationship allegedly constrained underscore agency, heavy armor of privilege. Yeah. All right. I told you it was going to eventually happen. Louisiana set to ban the teaching of racism. Yeah, let's put them up. You're looking at the Republican Party chairman of Louisiana, Chairman Louis Gervich. The GOP party officials in the state, they want Louisiana lawmakers to prohibit the study of racism and all colleges and universities claiming the, and I quote, inglorious aspects of American history are too divisive, according to NOLA.com, which cites a GOP resolution on the matter. Now, I want to take you down memory lane for just a moment. Remember the first day I came on this show and I said, Critical race theory 
is not about banning critical race theory. All of these anti-CRT bills do not ban critical race theory because critical race theory is taught in less than 1% of collegiate curriculum and it is not taught at all, at all in K through 12 education. When you actually read the bill, each bill banned a teacher's ability to actually teach a historical lesson rooted in a racial dynamic, whatever that racial dynamic may be. It was to stop analytical thinking. It was to stop critical thought, not critical race theory. It was to restrict a teacher's ability to actually bring you a full lesson about the reality of this country's origin. Now, they're saying the quiet part out loud. They would like to ban the entire teaching of racism. Think about how silly that is. If you ban the teaching of racism, some, some of you may say, well, that may be a good idea, Doc. I mean, we can now focus on things like unity. You really think so? If they ban racism, how do you now teach Dr. King? If you ban racism, how do you teach Gandhi? If you ban racism, how do you teach the civil rights movement in America? As a matter of fact, if you ban the teaching of racism, how can you ever understand the true origins of America? There's more. The state GOP leadership also, also wants to nix diversity, equity, and inclusion departments at all colleges, all universities, claiming without evidence that such agencies stir political tensions on campuses and have over generous budgets, according to NOLA.com. A third of Louisiana residents are black, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. A spokesperson for the Republican Party of Louisiana, which lauds limited government and the rights of the people, did not immediately respond to insiders' request for comment on Sunday. Now, I want you to be reminded, the same individuals who are saying, let's get rid of diversity inclusion departments. Let's get rid of diversity executives because they stir political tensions. Well, I guarantee you nothing like the political tension that was stirred when terrorists tried to overthrow the United States government, enforce a rule of law not, uh, not congruent to our rule of law. That is permissible to many of these Republicans. Don't dare talk about racism. There's more. All right, so Louisiana GOP, really interesting. Uh, the effort comes as dozens of states have proposed legislation that would prohibit diversity, equity, and inclusion offices. Just think about this. There's a movement to eliminate positions to help integrate our society in racial context. So they want to prohibit DEI offices and training, diversity statements, diversity statements they would like to prohibit, statements that say, hey, we're diverse and we appreciate diversity. They want to prohibit that, make that illegal. There's more. And identity preferences in hiring and admissions. They want to get rid of identity preferences in hiring and admissions. The Republican effort follows an attempt to stop the teaching of critical race theory, which as a legal approach taught largely to, in graduate schools and policies that address race in general form, various aspects, general, uh, general from various aspects of public life. Let me go back to um, an interesting dynamic that I want to highlight for the record. As a professor, I'm well aware of what this actually means. If you get rid of your identity dynamics as it relates to admissions inside of an institution. But that means it becomes illegal to ask, um, what race are you? Let me tell you why that part is important. You see, students uh, that connect to a college, they're not connecting to that college just because of their academic prowess. Um, you are more than an academic summary. You are, you are a whole human being. Where you come from, what you have overcome, 
uh, the aspects of your recreational life as well as your leadership life, what you volunteer to do. These things are important to us. These things are important to the campus culture. And it is up to the college campus what kind of culture they would like to connect with. And they go after students who uphold the values of that culture based on how the board of trustees sees it. This would eliminate any approach that would allow for that cultural dynamic. By law, it would eliminate it. There's more. Uh, that drew a response from the University of Louisiana system president, okay? Jim Henderson, who said the claims in the GOP resolution were, and I quote, so foreign to the reality of our institutions, it defies comment, according to a statement shared with insiders. So the college president said, this is so damn insane, it really defies a comment being required. Uh, that is it. What's happening? A retelling of the narrative? You know, history has always been what it is. His story. They're rewriting it right in front of you. They're not waiting 20 years, 50 years, 100 years to tell you a different tale. They're doing it in real time, knowing that members of the media will pick up on it. Some will simply report it as if it is fact. What is this truly about? This is about the future problem solvers of America not knowing what the real problem is. They are afraid of the emerging generation of leaders coming out of high schools and colleges all over this country because we have universally concluded that the actions of those who founded this nation, the actions of the early settlers, the actions of those who were leaders during Jim Crow were morally wrong. And because we have universally said this now, the problem solvers to correct what they did are currently in the classrooms that they are trying to control. That is why no matter what contract I sign with colleges I teach at, I require that they allow me to teach at least two classes per semester, regardless of if I'm a dean or director, because it is important for people who are conscious to be inside of classrooms. Sharing thoughts on this. Wow. And I wonder, and you're highly sought after, how how soon your contracts, you'll have to require them to allow you to tell the truth. Exactly. I, how soon before we can just check the racism box? Yep. Just check the box of racism. Just say, say what it is, man. And we can all just acknowledge it at least. Can we start there, Doc? Yep. I mean, if, if they want to have an honest conversation, the real is this. They don't want to be uncomfortable. They don't want to be uncomfortable. This is not about uh, them not feeling included or them being embarrassed or ashamed or guilty. If they felt guilt sharing, they would actually try to help. This is about them not wanting to feel uncomfortable. All right, wow. we will follow up on this story as it develops. Married 911 operator is caught in a cop sex scandal and damn it, this gets deep. Let's put the picture up full mass. The hell is going on in these police departments? Uh, Crystal Perez, Merritt, Texas 911 dispatcher at San Antonio's Baxter County Sheriff's Department faces termination after she was allegedly caught sexting seven. She was sexting seven cops, having affairs with at least two others. Ms. Perez has been placed on leave over the sleazy messages, which saw her speak with both sergeant and deputy at length about alleged past tryst. Other messages sent by Perez, 38, and uncovered by her husband, Mr. Perez, 41, contain equally sexed up correspondence between her and four other officers employed by the force, as well as a cop at a nearby department. Now it's unfair for her to be the face of this story. Let's put up the other faces in this story. You got Deputy Juan Leo has been placed on unpaid leave and Deputy Jason Jarvis has been hit with a 30 day suspension. Damn, they would have been better off as far as penalty if they shot an unarmed citizen. Now, 
I'm going to explain in just a moment why this is problematic for everybody. Let's go to Sergeant Ronaldo Solanis, who has been placed on leave without pay also. All right. Salinas, Lil, Perez have all been warned by the county sheriff's office that they are likely to lose their jobs. They deny misbehaving while on duty. But the sheriff is now investigating to see whether this is true. <clears throat> Messages sent to Salinas su suggest he and Ms. Perez met up for sex while Jarvis's wife, who's now divorcing him, said he admitted an affair to her. We got the screenshots, put them up. Text messages, that's called receipts, okay? Those are receipts. Uh, let's put up the husband, Ms. Mr. Perez. All right. He said, and I quote, keep his picture up. She was the love of my life. And it was very distraught, heartbreaking. 41 year old, uh, Giancarlo told KABB San Antonio over the weekend of how his marriage imploded last December when he discovered the text on his wife's phone. I was in disbelief, he says in the clip, and at one point even appeared on the verge of retching as he recalled the traumatic discovery. Listen, man, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine, okay? Um, he knew some of these folks. I can't imagine. Uh, but let's be very clear why this is important for the public and for the community, period. Let's say something happens. Let's say you have to hold an officer accountable because they misstep. They committed a criminal violation. They violated the civil rights of another human being. Let's say that happened, right? If that happened, who do you think and everybody's compromised when people should be held accountable and a decision has to be made. Am I going to hold the person that I'm already committing this act with accountable or shut up, lie on the report, let it pass so it doesn't blow back on me? That is the problem. That is the public dynamic that has to be checked. These inappropriate relationships lead to a bad outcome for citizens who require transparency for the system of law enforcement to operate for them. Sharon, thoughts on this? I thought I worked at some wild places. <laughs> I just don't even, what is going on with these people and these places and these full frontal, well, confessions? I don't know that I would want to digest this publicly. Yeah, there you go. All right, uh, you know, what else can you say? Texas teen dragged out of a car for helping a friend who ran out of gas. Put up the pictures for a mask. Uh, this young man was being a good Samaritan. A football player at Langham Creek High School in suburban Houston was dragged out of a car, violently arrested, all while trying to simply do one thing, help a friend in the parking lot who ran out of gas. The Harris County Sheriff's Office announced last week that several deputies are now under investigation for their conduct during this incident. Video of the incident was shared on social media. Who is the great champion in this story? Social media and the person who put it on there. So this happened last week. We saw the video. It sparked outrage and accusations that the deputies used excessive force during the arrest. According to a statement released by the sheriff's office, the department is launching a probe to see if any policies and procedures were viola violated during this arrest. And what looks like chaos, the deputy is pulling the senior around and then slamming him on the ground. Other deputies around the car even try to stop the arrest from being filmed. The one passenger recording in the car is told to exit the vehicle before his phone is then taken. His phone is placed camera down by the deputy, obstructing any video for the remainder of the recording. The deputies arrested and originally charged both seniors 
in the altercation. They were also taken to jail. Let's put it up. One team was charged with misdemeanor count, a misdemeanor count of impeding a roadway. That charge still stands. It's a ridiculous charge. The other team, the one who got dragged out of the car, faced one count of assaulting a peace officer, a felony. The judge found no probable cause for that charge and dismissed it. You must understand that probable cause is literally the lowest standard, lowest standard. And the judge said, you didn't even meet the lowest standard for this dumbass charge, dismissed. There's more. In his first interview, okay, after the incident, the young man who was in this video took issue with the deputies being called peace officers. You see, the young brother didn't know that's what they were called. He says, I feel like police are really supposed to be peace officers. I feel like they just did a lot of aggravation. He wasn't really trying to be peaceful. I feel like we don't need people like that in the community. That's right. Now, you, sir, are the champion that would lead the community to a better way because you have something many do not insight you have insight now after circulating this viral video uh, the sheriff's office released a statement saying after reviewing the videos we are investigating the incident to determine if any policies and procedures were violated we take these matters seriously and will ensure a thorough investigation is completed in a timely manner. Our deputies are held to the higher standard of professionalism and many, many, and any, excuse me, employee whose conduct does not align with departmental policies will be held accountable for their um, actions. All right, we, we shall see. It always takes you guys a long time to figure out how to investigate people that wear uniforms. Um, but typically the people who wear uniforms who work for you uh, it takes them a split second uh, to make a conclusion about somebody's guilt or innocence, if they need to go to jail or not, be charged or not. It takes you all mm, weeks, months, sometimes even years to figure it out based on evidence available to you right now. All right, Sharon, thoughts on this case? Yeah, and in the first 10 seconds uh, of, of your uh, delivery there, Dr. Ritchie, I made my uh, determinant kidnapping, assault, Yep. False police report, violation of civil rights. It's a two hour flight, I believe, from Kansas City, Missouri to Houston. And if we could get Ben Crump on it, perhaps we could speed this this That's investigation right. up. Yeah, and I'm sure he's aware. So we mm -hmm. shall see. I guarantee you there will be an update this week. All right. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable stick and stay. All right, welcome back. Let me read a few of these comments. I appreciate everyone for joining the conversation. Uh, worst case scenario, Dragon, uh, ban real teaching and kids will learn it from social media. That will make everyone a hater. Social media is toxic AF. Yeah. Um, cats and Dragon, so are they going to do away with degrees in history, sociology, anthropology, political science, et cetera. It's impossible. It is impossible to properly learn about geopolitics, about uh, national or international uh, history without understanding elements of racism. It is impossible. All right, and Lone Wolf, all they wanted to do was give these kids a police record. Yep, no charges, no bill from the grand jury after police decided to shoot to death uh, Mr. Jalen Walker, over 60 shots. Let me take you to the video and I'm gonna bring you the update to this horrific story. Damn shame. That's reckless. Let's put up the picture of this young man. 
despite being shot to death 60 times and having his body desecrated by the Akron police. Grand jury decided to file no criminal charges against the eight cops involved in Jalen Walker's death. Let me give you a background on the jury. A special grand jury of six women, three men, including two black citizens, on Monday returned a no bill in Summit County Common Pleas Court, which means the jurors found the actions of the officers to be justified. Let's put up the Attorney General, Dave Yost. So Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost said Walker fired out of his vehicle while he was being chased by officers. He said a shell casing was recovered from the entrance ramp to State Route 8 and the ballistics matched the gun recovered in Walker's car after the shooting. The officer also witnessed Walker firing a shot and it was recorded on his dash cam video, according to Yost. He says the law allows officers to use deadly force to defend themselves or others against a deadly threat, Yost said. However, Yost said, the legal justification doesn't change the tragedy of 25 year old Walker's death. I grieve the loss of this promising young life, though I recognize no words of mine will offer comfort to the family. If you remember uh, in the original reporting of this story, the issue wasn't necessarily if Jalen may have committed an offense, that's separate. The issue was, were the officers at the time they decided to kill him in present danger? because that's the statute. You have to be in imminent danger. Imminent means imminent. It means right now, present. It doesn't mean vengeful. It doesn't mean somebody may have done something earlier and now you're going to get them back. It means right now that you're going to die or somebody else is going to die right now, imminent, or be severely injured. That was the question. Now you see the uh, prosecutor acting as a defense attorney, okay? And saying things on record in order to solidify the innocence of these officers. Grand jury proceedings also top secret. We do not know what was presented or not because we do not get access to the grand jury file. All right, Sharon, thoughts on this? It's like Mike Brown, remember that case? Yeah. Out of Missouri, we know after the fact, we learned that he was just portrayed as a drug addict high on marijuana. So, you know, the officer just had to kill him. It seems like it's always justified. And I've seen too many analysts, Dr. Ritchie, go on camera in the last 24 to 48 hours, and they're, they're contorting themselves. They're, they're so agile in explaining why it just had to be this way. But when you shoot off that many rounds, you're actually endangering people. You're not right. helping to save anybody. Yeah, and you got to think about that, Sharon, because as, as soon as I heard that many gunshots, I said, my goodness, that could kill anybody, right? Sure. Anybody who's standing around, a ricochet bullet, right? Somebody who's just in the vicinity, uh, it is a dangerous scenario. And let's not uh, get it twisted. We've reported right here on Indisputable, um, a white female inside of a hospital shoots her husband, shoots the roof of the hospital, and what does the cop say? Hey, guys, don't fire. We have all the time in the world. And they negotiated her out of that room as she was taken into custody after shooting a husband, shooting up the hospital, and a cop yelling to the other cops, do not fire. Why? Because he valued the life of that white woman that he saw who just shot her own husband. That's why it ended different for her. All right, Sharon, always a pleasure having you on the program. Tell people how they can follow you and check out your great work. At Sharon Reed Live, always. I uh, appreciate you always. Sharon. Boy, these stories, they're, they're tough. We need you now more than ever, Doc. Well, we need you and we are glad to have you. All right. Remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable.